So welcome to the Sano Genetics Podcast. I'm Patrick, the co-founder and CEO of Sano. Today, our guest is Dr. Alicia Martin. Alicia is a researcher at the Massachusetts General Hospital and the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard. If you haven't heard of these two places, they're uh, two of the world leading human genetics and genome sequencing centers based in Boston, the US. And Alicia's research crosses over between human population genetics and medical genetics with a particular focus on psychiatric disorders and how genetic risk scores translate between people with different ethnicities or ancestries. Hope I got that right. And thanks very much for coming on to the show, Alicia. Yeah, thanks for having me. That sounds good to me. Great. So would you mind just to get started giving us an overview on how you got into studying genetics in the first place? Sure. Yeah. So I've been interested in genetics my whole life, pretty much um, due to personal reasons. So my brother was actually born with cystic fibrosis. And so for um, family reasons, I've always been following the literature. Well, you know, not as a five-year-old or anything, but I've always been very interested in genetics and trying to understand what it means for different families and how we can try to overcome genetic disorders and how we can treat offer new treatments um, for those types of disorders. So I've been interested in this for decades. <laughs> right. Does it, uh, is it something that lots of people in the family work on, or are you the, the lone scientist in the Martin family? <laughs> I'm very much the black sheep and the lone scientist in my family, but right. people are generally very supportive of research engagement. Yeah, absolutely. So, so in the last couple of years, you've uh, led a couple of very important pieces of research, in my opinion, that have been focused around Eurocentricity in genetic studies. So I was, I was hoping you could explain exactly why this is such a big problem, um, what it is, and how you think about solving it. Yeah, so we've been looking at Eurocentricity for a long time, and we've known since basically genetic studies have started to ramp up that we've had this really big Eurocentric problem. So there was a study in about 2009 that showed that 96% of participants in genetic studies were of European descent. Clearly, that's really problematic and far out of step with the global population where European ancestry individuals make up roughly about 16% of the global population. So this is really a big um, health inequities issue if we're starting to think about translating genetic technologies. But this message is not new. I mentioned that study in 2009, so it's been now a decade. And here, looking at 2019, um, we've seen that now the proportion of individuals of European descent only constitute a mere 80% <laughs> of the individuals that make up those uh, research participants. So this is a really big issue and it hasn't changed as much as we would like it to, to reflect the global representation of individuals. And so I've always been asking this question in my research, how does the knowledge that we gain from genetic studies actually translate across these globally diverse populations? Um, given that we have such a biased and Eurocentric view, how much does that actually matter? We know that the fundamental biology is shared across diverse human populations, but those genetic variants differ in frequency and all sorts of different factors due to human population history. So that's generally how I became interested in it and like what we've kind of been exploring in broad terms over time. Right. So is there any example that you like to use that's, that's particularly poignant or that gets the point across? I know you study psychiatric genetics and I've heard you talk about height before as, as one example. What's a, what's a kind of example of this that we can latch on to? Um, I think height is a really nice and tangible one, as you mentioned. Height is very easy to measure. We've measured it in many, many millions of people that we've also measured genetic data in. So it's really easy to capture. Um, and when we actually try to predict something like height using genetic data, we do a much better job predicting it in people of European descent due to these vast Eurocentric study biases. It's not that there's anything special about height in someone of European descent compared to someone, say, of African descent. It's simply, you know, a consequence of their genetic makeup and who we're studying. So if we try to look at height in different populations using existing studies, there's a lot of dependency on what study we're looking at in terms of uh, how well we're predicting these um, different traits. So looking at height, um, if we try to predict um, using these Eurocentric uh, studies across a globally diverse set of populations, we predict most accurately how tall European individuals are. But the problem is sort of insidious actually beyond that because when we look at how well we predict across different populations, there's also these mean shifts 
And so we try to compare um, height across different populations from a genetics perspective. We're predicting that European populations are the tallest and that everybody else is shorter than Europeans. But it's not that they're sort of a little bit shorter. The problem is pretty dramatic with some yeah. studies. Yeah. So like if we take the average European man and say maybe, sorry for the um, US centric measuring system, but <laughs> maybe you can convert this. If we say that the average European man is something like five feet, nine inches tall, and then predict how tall the average African man is by some, um, some standard large scale genetic studies, we would predict that the average African man would be like four and a half feet tall. Right, so these scores are essentially kind of com completely meaningless once you've taken it out of the, the group that you originally trained the model on. Exactly, and it really depends on the study that we're looking at. So if we look at other studies that have less heterogeneity, then we'll predict the differences to be smaller, but we'll still not capture those differences well. So right now, it's just not possible to compare across populations using genetic data based on polygenic prediction alone. Right, and I guess height, height is a, uh, you know, not a particularly medically relevant example in most cases, but if you took what you just said and applied it to predicting heart attack risk or risk of having a stroke or relapse of cancer or something like that, then it becomes apparent that the, the problem is huge, right? You can't have something that only works in Europeans. Exactly. Yeah, totally. If we think about something like, say, schizophrenia, we don't have dramatic differences in prevalence across different populations, but from a genetic risk prediction perspective, if you're drawing that cutoff uh, to say someone has schizophrenia or not based on their genetic data, it just doesn't work. So we're really sort of struggling with that right now. Right. So what's the solution for that? Is it as simple as we need to be more representative of the world population when we do genetic studies or is it, is it anything more complicated than that? Um, I think we need kind of to push on two fronts. So one is absolutely we need much greater diversity in our representation of individuals. And then the other is we need better statistical methods um, to try to build these genetic predictors that better account for this, these differences in population history and genetic diversity. Do, do you see this as a, as a non-starter when it comes to translating genomic risk scores into the clinic? If, so there's a lot of discussion around predictions of uh, cardiovascular disease using genomic risk scores. Is, do you think it's, is it in a way irresponsible to say, if, we, if in the UK tomorrow they said we're going to do genomic risk scores for everyone who's, um, you know, has a family history of cardiovascular disease, that the fact that we know it doesn't work um, as well in some parts of the population as other, do you, do you see this as we, you know, we can't roll it out until we've solved this problem or is it, or is rolling it out a way to solve the problem? Yeah, I think we need to continue to evaluate that question. And right now I think it's fairly problematic and it's different from other um, clinical risk factors for a few reasons. If we take something like cardiovascular disease, um, one of the best predictors we have for uh, you know, risk of heart attack is something like LDL cholesterol. LDL cholesterol might on average differ across populations at some level due to different environmental effects, but fundamentally the, um, the biomarker, the measure that we're using fundamentally means the same thing across different populations. So if you have an LDL that's high in a European ancestry individual versus in an African ancestry individual, that's problematic either way. Um, if we have a genetic risk predictor in a European ancestry individual, it fundamentally it has more meaning than a genetic risk score in an African ancestry individual. And that's really problematic because it means that even though we're looking at basically a biomarker, it's far more meaningful in those European ancestry individuals. And these are not small differences. So when we look at the relative um, prediction accuracy in a European ancestry individual versus an African ancestry individual right now in the UK using large scale UK biobank data, the difference in prediction accuracy is something like four to five fold. So it's not small. Right, so, so I guess that would mean the, to put some numbers on this, and I think we might be, we might be estimating a little bit here, but if the, the highest group of people in the cardio or in the coronary artery disease risk group, for example, might have, what, a 20 or 30 percent lifetime risk in the European ancestry, but in a non-European ancestry, that lifetime risk might be more like 10% or something like that, right? So it's a huge difference where you're not, um, you're talking 
like you said, three, four, five times difference based on the same score. Yeah, that's right. So do, so do you think that is, is, co is collecting this data as part of the healthcare system? So in the UK, for example, I, my understanding is that UK Biobank is, is you know, roughly um, representative of the UK population, but the problem is that the majority of the UK population is of European ancestry. So it means that even if you were to collect basically equally, across the population, you're, you're always going to underperform in underrepresented groups. Do, do we need to basically boost, intentionally boost the sample size in groups that are of non-European ancestry to, to get it right? Yeah, exactly. So this is a global issue. We can't solve this with one country, with one, with one ancestry or one background. We need to come together as a community in the genetics field to be able to solve this problem because you're totally right that we're not going to be able to solve this in the UK alone and where I live in the US we're not going to be able to solve that in the US alone even though we're currently not representing our own population very well. What are what are some of the best examples of people that are solving this? I know there's a big project H3 Africa that's going on. I'm not sure about the all of us program in the US. There's also um, East London Genes and Health in the UK, for example. Are there, are there other good ones? What's the best, best couple of models to look for to do this right? Yeah, I think you've named a lot of the really big, awesome ones. A few others that are disease specific that I would highlight are the type 2 diabetes efforts. Um, there are some very big multi-ethnic efforts there, especially that are looking at Hispanic and Latino populations in the Americas with higher prevalences of type 2 diabetes. In the psychiatric space, there are some efforts by the Stanley Center uh, where I work to initiate global collection efforts. So there's a very large scale um, project going on to enhance the scale of uh, collections in Africa right now, especially in Eastern and Southern Africa, which are almost unrepresented in psychiatric studies, uh, psychiatric genetic studies to date. So there's a few others that are disease specific, but I think in terms of the collections of large scale biobanks, you've captured a few. There are others, um, there are other large ones that are going on, for example, in East Asia that are quite large. So there's the Biobank Japan, there's the China Kadori Biobank. Um, there's a few other um, biobanks in East Asia that I think are large growing and are starting to be coupled with um, biobanks of European descent. What, what role do you think that direct-to-consumer genetic testing companies play in this? Because some of them are, are huge. Uh, I, I don't know the exact numbers, but I know Ancestry is north of 10 million people. I think 23andMe is between 5 and 10 million. They, they may also be non-representative, but in terms of just the raw numbers, they probably have a huge number of participants do. What's, what's the role? How much are they engaging with research in this? And, and what do you see as, what's their responsibility, I suppose, as, uh, you know, as stewards of this data on behalf of their customers and also working with researchers? Yeah, that's a great question. I think you're right in that they do absolutely have um, a big role to play. And I think they actually have a responsibility to help um, with those inequities and those issues because they're so consumer facing and they are delivering this information to individuals of very diverse um, ancestries. And I know that they're, at least in 23andMe's case, in full disclosure, I have collaborations ongoing with them. Um, they're very interested in expanding the breadth of reach that they can have um, across different ancestries. I know multiple different direct-to-consumer companies are really worried about these inequalities and these issues and are trying to work to build new methods and to uh, share their data at least in summary form so that researchers can take advantage of that data to build more equal predictors. Well, and, I, and from my perspective, I think 23andMe has done better than most, at least in their marketing efforts. Of they, they do say whenever they can that particular tests you know, work better or worse on particular groups of people. It's, a, it's, it's unfortunate that they have to say that, but it's better that that they do and, and people are aware. I, I, to me, what's hard about this whole problem is that the deeper you drill down, there's always going to be a group that the test performs better and worse in, right? Even if we solve, if we, if we start to collect from on the continent level, roughly equally, then it's still within the continent, there's going to be biases, right? If you talk about a big East Asian project, there's going to be, you know, maybe underrepresentation in the west of China compared to the east. Is this a problem that we're going to be just chasing for decades or how do you see? Is it, is it 
going to be until we sequence the entire globe that we don't have these problems anymore. Uh, that's a good question. I wouldn't sell genetic short in terms of its ability to grow rapidly and overcome problems. Just looking at the last decade, the progress has been so incredibly impressive to see what people have accomplished, going from studies on the scale of hundreds or thousands to studies now on the scale of millions. It's really awesome to see what is actually possible with these large scale investments in biomedical research. So I think we'll solve this problem at some point in time to some extent. Yes, there will be limitations in that some populations are going to have uh, more accurate predictors than others. That said, um, I hope these gaps shrink to the point where they're no longer something that we need to worry about to the extent that we do now, so that they're subtle differences as opposed to these massive, you know, orders of magnitude differences or, you know, nearly order of magnitude differences. So I think we need to worry about it a lot at the moment because it's such a huge issue. Um, I hope that this changes over the near term. Um, yeah. It's also concerning, I think, that, you know, longer term we'll need to consider who this works in better, both not just in terms of population, but also in terms of things like age, sex, other factors that influence your health risk overall. Right. We're probably just getting started, right? There's also interactions with the environment. Um, I think I listened to you on uh, another podcast and you were talking with Razib Khan about, you know, there may be subtle differences in diet, for example, that people with roughly the same correlations between genetics and diet could confound some of these studies. So we're probably just scratching the surface on this in terms of the the potential confounding factors, right? Maybe ethnicity being being the first and one of the largest, but certainly not the last. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, this is somewhat related, but but a, a little bit different. Uh, I I saw in, you participating in some discussion on Twitter a little while ago around a company in the U.S. that was going to use genetic risk scores to select embryos for higher IQ. Um, and I know you and many others have pretty strong scientific objections to this. I think the, the moral objections are one, you know, one category, but there's, there's a second category, which is just plain old, can we do it, scientific objections. I was wondering if you'd mind just describing the general idea and, and why it's, uh, it, it has some issues scientifically and or morally, whichever direction you decide to take. Yeah, so I don't want to tackle the moral piece because I feel like there are a lot of folks who are better suited to tackle that one, but I would say I think there is a very strong moral argument to be made. The scientific issues, I would say there are several. So one is that when a couple goes in to do IVF, they only have a few viable offspring between two parents, and there's just not that much genetic variance between them um, to choose from. And so really a lot of the polygenic score selection right now would be selling something like snake oil for the choice of an embryo that is going to be a lifelong uh, choice. So that's one problem. Another problem is that if you're trying to positively select on something like IQ, we don't actually know everything about what that means. So for example, positive IQ is also associated with higher risk of autism. That's a single example, but we just kind of need to consider what um, what all opportunities there are for things to potentially go wrong. Are, do the risks outweigh the benefits? In this case, possibly. Um, there's several issues that we don't necessarily understand. We just don't really have a full grasp on the risks right now. And I think that's really problematic if you're thinking about this uh, for a child who's going to you know, exist throughout, um, throughout its entire life. And then another issue is um, this ancestry and ethnicity issue again. So often we're thinking about uh, this in a single easy case, but when it comes to thinking about the entire population, um, there are many biracial couples, there are many couples of non-European descent, and we have no idea um, whether when you're selecting based on a polygenic score for one trait, whether you're actually um, unintentionally selecting for one ancestry background, basically. So let's say we have two African Americans who want to have a child via IVF and are interested in undergoing this polygenic screening. It's possible that just as a consequence of their mixed um, background that they'll be accidentally selecting for those embryos that just have more European ancestry. And so there may be this unintentional sort of like ethnic selection that we really don't want to have happening. Um, and then also just thinking about like, what do you want for your child and for your future? Do you want 
the smartest possible embryo? Do you want the happiest possible embryo? There's like a whole lot of traits that we care about in humanity. And if you think about the smartest possible person that you know, if that's what you want your child to be, this may or may not be the way to get that. But there's also a lot of things you could should consider about the smartest person you know. Um, right. So there's just so many things to consider that I think we don't have a grasp on even remotely yet. And how how good are the how good are the predictions even if in the best case scenario, how well can you predict um, educational attainment or IQ from genetics? My understanding is even in the largest studies, we're only capturing a small proportion of the, you know, of, of the variants, you're only predicting one or two IQ points, right? It's not like you can predict tens or, you know, many tens of differences in IQ. Is that, is that right? It's a, it's a small difference anyways. Yeah, I think the educational attainment predictor is predicting something on the order of a few months of education. So it's, you know, a few months might be somewhat meaningful, but it's not really going to be a game changer. So Again, we, I think, kind of need to think about this right now in the context of being not particularly informative. Um, it's helpful, I think, in a research context, but I would be very leery to recommend this to anybody for, a, you know, selecting an embryo. Yeah, I, mean, I, think, I think most people are probably with you on that. I've heard, um, it goes all the way back to Darwin, that he noticed that when you, when you breed you know, animals, for example, towards one direction, whether it's, you know, a basset hound with long ears or a golden retriever with, you know, its golden coat, you end up with unexpected, unintended consequences, just as you were saying earlier, right? You think you're just selecting for one thing, but actually you end up, uh, other traits come along for the ride and we don't really understand why. So this idea that we can just look at four embryos, apply a score to it, pick one that's gets the best and then everything's going to be fine is, is probably a little bit naive. Yeah, totally. I think we need to have quite a bit of diversity in our population to maintain health. And I think dogs and crops are a very good example of what happens when we do this polygenic selection. Dogs have different kinds of breeds, have cancer issues or hip dysplasia issues or brachiocephaly where they have respiratory issues. There's all sorts of challenges that we don't anticipate when we do this kind of polygenic selection. With crops as well, when we go towards a monoculture, um, some, they're very good at one thing, but they're more susceptible to certain types of uh, um, immune challenges, let's say. So there's all sorts of issues that we might not anticipate, and I'm really concerned about those. Right. So uh, I know that a lot of your work is focused around more common or complex conditions and traits, but we do have quite a few guests and, and listeners on the podcast that are interested in rare or Mendelian disease. I was wondering if you if you know of any dif- evidence for differences in incidents or you know, how, how does this work that you've done in common traits where we maybe have many hundreds of thousands of people extend down into the Mendelian or rare disease traits, do you see the same evidence for um, differences in predictive performance or, or diagnostic rate or anything like that? So I'm not too much of an expert in that, but I will say that um, for rare diseases, because we have these strong Eurocentric biases in sequencing data as well um, for diagnosis of rare diseases, we do end up with far more variants of unknown significance in non-European ancestry folks. We also know that some Mendelian diseases that we've thought of as like a classical one gene scenario have a lot of modifiers or actually have a bit of a continuum into the complex disease space. So Um, Familial hypercholesterolemia, for example, um, is a disease where individuals have much higher uh, cholesterol than average in the population and therefore are at higher risk of heart attack. That's actually a continuum as well, and it seems like there are some polygenic contributors to that that disease. So I can tell you those two things, but beyond that, I'm not the expert for the rare disease. Yeah, and I guess even you mentioned um, cystic fibrosis at the at the very beginning that my understanding is that some of the risk variants for cystic fibrosis are also population specific, right? That depending on where your parents, grandparents, their grandparents came from, you could be at drastically higher or lower risk. And it it may be that we're just not detecting some of the risk factors in non-European populations as well, right? Because of the way testing has been done. Yeah, certainly. So I think in that scenario, we have some variants that we very much nailed down, others that we don't know as well, and also a lot of disease modifiers. 
that may impact, say, the respiratory system or may impact the pancreas, uh, pancreas function. And we just don't have a firm handle on all of the multifactorial contributions to these rare diseases. Right. Um, so I, I know just to close out here that you, you're currently in Finland and you spend at least a month or two a year in Finland. Um, you're most of the time in Boston in the U.S., but I was wondering if you could give an overview of what's so unique about the healthcare system and the research environment in Finland that makes it such a, a hot spot for genetics research. There's, there's quite a few amazing research projects that are going on there right now. So I think it'd be great to hear more about that. Yeah, so Finland is a really interesting place for a few reasons. One is, of course, the population history is a bit unique compared to many parts of the world. So it's a bottlenecked population. Of course, um, humans migrated into Finland after, with a bottleneck um, compared to other parts of Europe, but there was a subsequent bottleneck once um, individuals were in Finland migrating into the northeastern part of the country. So there's a depletion of genetic diversity in general. So there's a lot of homogeneity in general. Um, the healthcare system is also very, very advanced, I would say. So especially coming from a U.S. perspective, it's amazing to see what these Scandinavian health records have stored. So over the past many decades, um, medical records have been stored in an easily retrievable way. Um, there's a lot of, I think, social buy-in to the healthcare system here. Um, and it's so uniform and homogeneously collected in contrast with the U.S., for example, to the point where it's very easy to do very large-scale genetic studies and large-scale epidemiology, epidemiology studies. So we can really couple these to learn in depth about how different genetic variants are changing over time, tracking uh, rare diseases, looking across the country with different birth records um, to try to understand how these are evolving. And in thinking about the polygenic case um, or the polygenic risk prediction scenario in particular, it's really amazing to see um, these surveys being conducted where in a research setting, people are being given back a risk prediction um, for say cardiovascular disease with their traditional risk factors and then also with their genetic factors and seeing how they respond. Do they engage with the healthcare system if they're at the high end of genetic risk plus clinical risk? And that does seem to be the case here. I think partially because there is so much more trust in the healthcare system, but people are generally going to see their PCP um, at a higher rate than those individuals who are not given their genetic information. So it's just really awesome to see how advanced, um, how advanced their healthcare system is. Right. So that, so that study you're referring to is the, is that the cardio composite one? Yeah. So they, yeah. So, so they basically, they run a polygenic risk score. Like you say, if people are identified as high risk or do they communicate your risk no matter what, whether you're high or low risk. And, and at that point you're given the opportunity to engage with a cardiologist or a general practitioner. And I guess in many cases, people also make lifestyle changes, right? If they know they're at high risk for, cardiovascular disease, they might take that information and, and, and just choose to change their behavior. Yeah, exactly. I think it helps to have such an educated population as well. Just their buy-in to the social healthcare system is very high because their engagement is very strong due to this high education level in general. So it's great to see that they're making lifestyle changes. They're going, they're making diet um, and exercise changes. They're making decisions to go to their GP, or their, um, sorry, their uh, like general practitioner more often. So all of those things I think are really cool. Yeah, it seems to me like the next, the next decade, we have an opportunity and a challenge to actually understand how to make these scores actionable, right? We're good at predicting and, and getting better at finding high-risk individuals, although we have lots of challenges. But actually, what do you do next? You can't just give someone this information, probably, because most people... Um, you know, we, it's just like if you tell someone smoking is bad, most people are going to say, no, I understand, but may not change their behavior. So it sounds like there's a huge opportunity to actually understand, um, you know, once we have this information, what next? Yeah, I think we're going to need to educate the public to some extent, but I also think that we can think of this in the same context as other clinical risk factors. You probably don't know what your LDL is because you probably haven't memorized that, for example, but you probably know whether it's high, medium, low, something like that. And I think we can probably break that down for people um, kind of at the same level and couple that with all the other clinical factors to make it a fairly digestible piece of information. Right. And, and I just uh, was wondering if you could, you're the expert on this, um, but I always find it so fascinating. You talked about the 
the bottleneck in Finland. Would you mind just describing from a historical perspective about what we know about that? How many people, what was the size of the bottleneck? I just, I just find this kind of thing fascinating to, to think back to when this you know, frozen land was, was founded. How many people kind of made it through and settled initially? Yeah, so I think on the scale of about two to 4,000 years ago, um, something on the scale of hundreds to maybe about 1,000 individuals settled Finland. And then wow. from there, there was a subsequent bottleneck as people moved into the north. So quite a bit smaller than what you um, would imagine most of the rest of Europe being settled was like. That's amazing. And how does that compare to out of Africa, for example? How, what were the size of the waves of people? I have no idea, so I'm hoping, <laughs> hoping you know. <laughs> Yeah, so when we think about the out of Africa bottleneck, we often use this term effective population size, which is basically the number of individuals that we would effectively see to have the same like genetic diversity as whatever this number is. So when we have these big population expansions um, that have happened, for example, over the past uh, several generations or many decades, um, we only maintain basically the same amount of genetic diversity as a like few generations that came before. Yes, there was this big expansion, but we don't see a massive explosion in genetic diversity because they all descend from the same parents. Yeah. So the effective population sizes in Africa are somewhere on the scale of about 20,000, and the effective population sizes that came out of Africa are something on the scale of roughly 10,000, so about a half um, what you see in Africa. So that's, that's the rough scale, but of course there are more individuals to make up that effective genetic diversity. Right, and, and I guess this plays into some of your, you were saying earlier how there's greater genetic diversity in Africa in general, and this causes problems with the risk scores that you described, right? And is, it, is it the reason I've noticed that they typically perform the worst in African populations? Is this because there is so much more genetic diversity that we're failing to model, or, or is that not the case? Um, it's sort of twofold. So one is that there are just more genetic variants to begin with, as you're talking about. And the other is that if you're looking across the globe and comparing to the Eurocentric uh, populations that we have measured, um, the populations that are most genetically diverged from the European populations are those African ancestry populations. Right. So it's a combination of things. That makes sense. Okay, great. I think we've uh, covered a lot of ground today. Uh, so thanks very much for the, for the wonderful discussion. Sure, yeah, happy to be here. Uh, one other topic that I guess we should sort of touch on is yep. this is an issue of uh, sort of global parity as we talked about, but since we're talking a little bit about communication and engagement generally, I would say that one area that's really important is to think about what local communities who are typically underrepresented in genetic studies have to gain from those studies and what the balance is with global um, engagement. So for example, when we do genetic studies, I think it's really important that we give something back to the local communities and that this sort of safari research or helicopter research is not happening where geneticists are going into new parts of the world that haven't traditionally been involved in genetics research, taking say samples and doing whatever with those samples and then not returning anything to the communities. So I think we need to have some research capacity building going on for those areas of the world that are newer to genetics research so that we actually can build these fruitful, long-term, sustainable research collaborations and that people who are developing these new technologies can develop them both for um, globally diverse and local communities that haven't really been involved or engaged quite as much, either due to limited resources or just being newer to the genetics landscape. Yeah, I think that's a, a, a great point. How, how do you see that best working? Is it about empowering people in local communities to train to become geneticists and, and solve the problems of their community? Is it, uh, what, what are some of the strategies that you've seen working? Yeah, absolutely. I think local engagement with diverse um, collaborators is really important. So we have some large scale uh, collaborations going on in, as I mentioned, Eastern and Southern Africa. And so there we're helping train researchers in statistical and population genetics um, so that they actually can take on some of these studies themselves and build future labs that will be leading a lot of these genetics endeavors so that there can be some local sustainable effort to do this kind of research and that there doesn't necessarily need to be foreign um, aid for all of all of the future but they can actually start to take on these studies themselves yeah and i think it's also worth talking about 
even even in the U.S., for example, we have a we have a terrible history from the Tuskegee syphilis experiments. I mean, I, I put the Henrietta Lacks is an is an anecdote that falls under the category of it's no wonder why people don't trust scientific research because we don't have it's only until very recently that um, that we've been starting to do things quote unquote the right way, right? So there's some you know, there's some expected mistrust in science. Absolutely. It's totally earned that there is a mistrust in the U.S. and across the world um, from the scientist's perspective or from, you know, from the layperson's perspective to the scientist. And I think that that's earned in the law enforcement field. It's earned in the medical field. Um, and so I think we have a lot of work to do to try to overcome these uh, mistrust issues. So if, uh, if people want to keep up with your work, I would suggest that they follow you on Twitter. Um, it's at Genetosaur, G-E-N-E-T-I-S-A-U-R. At, at least that's how I say it. How, how did you get that Twitter handle? It seems like <laughs> pretty prime real estate. Yeah, so we came up with that when I was in grad school. Um, we have this volleyball team that plays at our retreat every year, and we always came up with these nerdy um, animal names that were coupled with something in the genetic space. So our first one, right. they, they kind of declined in originality towards the end, but the first one was Genetosaur. There were subsequent ones like um, PCR Vark. I think towards the very end, it was like BRD unicorns. So <laughs> right. I <laughs> just always, a nerdy series of animals. I always uh, assumed that it was your interest in, in studying history from a genetics lens that it was around dinosaurs maybe but it's good to know that it has uh, volleyball roots <laughs> yep. okay great so I would uh, I would highly recommend you follow Alicia because she is uh, she posts a lot of great new papers but she also does quite a bit of science communication and, and commentary on some um, good and bad science that's out there so if you want to learn some of this stuff, then definitely I'd recommend you follow her. Thank you all very much for listening. As always, you can send any feedback, including questions you have or guests you'd like to see on the show to podcast at sonogenetics.com. And as always, if you like the podcast, we'd love it if you could share with a friend or leave us a review wherever you see your podcasts. Finally, feel free to visit our website to learn more about this topic and others through our blog and to see the interesting research projects we're supporting right now. Thanks for listening and we'll see you next time.